Metro 2035, Dmitry Glukovsky, Chapter 16, The Final Broadcast. What do I do with this? Lyoka asked, struggling to get his bitten tongue round the words. What sort of question is that? Artyom looked round at him as if he was seeing him for the first time. Lyoka was lounging back with his gas mask pulled up onto his forehead. Liquid was flowing out of his mouth, and he was holding an open bottle of homebrew. Savelli had given it to him to disinfect his wound. Give me some, too. Artyom swigged, but it didn't help. Lyoka's shrushed teeth grated in Artyom's mouth. He looked at the neck of the bottle. It was completely red. He took another swig. Let's go. Savelli plonked down onto his animal pelt. Where to? Artyom turned his head towards the stalker. Hello? Where to? What do you mean, where to? Back? To Moscow? Back, back. Are you crazy? Forward. To Ekaterinburg. Home. Right now? Right now, friend. Right now. Before those fiends come back. Artyom thought for a moment. He stuck his head out of the car and spat in the dust. What about the people? What people? Well, in the metro. The people in the metro. What will they do? What's going to happen to them? What's supposed to happen to them? Well, they have. They have to be told. They have to find out. That we're not alone. That there are jammers. That they can go wherever they like. That's what I'm talking about. Wherever you like. Don't you get it? We have a chance right now. All the roads are open. A full tank of diesel in the canisters back there. We've got a head start. We picked up plenty of guns and cartridges. It's a now or never situation. But those big trucks really will come back. And they'll fix everything. And the jammers will start working again. And everything will be the same way it was. Then what? Won't anyone find out that there's a whole world out there? That they can up, come out of the metro? Those who heard it, heard it, okay? They'll figure things out for themselves. Well, are you coming? But who did hear it? No one's even bothering to listen. Well, fuck them, then. You can't say that. Oh, yes, I can. This is the Sverdlovsk region speaking. How long have I been waiting for that? What metro? What's the metro got to do with anything? This is it, my day. I've got to get moving. This is what I was waiting for. Exactly what I was waiting for and preparing for. Artyom pushed the door with his foot and got out of the car. He threw his head back and looked up at the pylons that were silent now. Lyoka slurped down booze without saying anything. Savilius spun a knob on his radio. A jabbering voice with bird R's spoke out of it. Paris, damn it, said the stalker. Hey, how do you fancy shooting off to Paris? I fancy it, said Artyom, to join the faggots. Savilius roared with laughter at duping Artyom like that. What's stopping you? My stepfather's in the metro. My wife's in the metro. And as well as that, everything I have is in the metro. I can't just not tell them anything, can I? Just go away and leave them there. The stalker turned the key. The motor started chugging. Well, it's up to you. I don't have a stepfather in the metro or a stepmother. Apart from whores, I don't have anyone in the metro. And whores aren't likely to just jump up and go dashing off anywhere. The darkness is handier for them. How do you know that? Whores are not whores. Artyom's blood was beginning to boil. No one will stay stuck in the metro of their own free will. People think there's nowhere for them to go to. Those red bastards have locked people in the metro and they're keeping them there. They've hidden the whole planet from them. How do you feel about that? I don't give a shit. You don't give a shit to hell with the whole damn place? I really don't give a shit, believe it. I don't give a shit for the metro. For the people. For whoever is keeping someone else somewhere for some reason. That's no business of mine any longer. I know something else, too. If we hang about here for another ten minutes, we'll all be dog food. I say stop playing the God Almighty hero. Fasten your seatbelt and let's go. I can't, Artyom answered in a low voice after a moment's thought. I can't go to damn blasted Paris when everyone I have is in there. And I have to get them out to tell them, everyone, they're being tricked. Everything they do, it's all a waste of time. The tunnel, the fighting, the worms, the whole thing, don't you see? It's all for nothing. The living space, the war, the mushroom plague, the famine, 40,000 people, live people, all of them. Not just my stepfather, not just all the others, all the people. I have to let them out. You do as you choose. 
Savalai replied. Art Yom paused for a moment. He reached his hand out to Lyoka and took another swig of crushed teeth. And you do as you choose, he said. So what are you going to do? Art Yom's head was splitting. He shrugged. I'll stay here. I'll try to break them. The pylons. How can you? I don't know. Maybe they have grenades or something here. Uh-huh. Now he wants a grenade. Served up on a plate. Okay, there's no point. Yet you want to croak, I'm not your comrade. Art Yom nodded. Hello, up there in the gallery. Savilawai and turned to Lioka. Who are you with? I'll stay here for now. The first apostle said with his red lips. I'm not so fast. Well then, fuck you both, Savalia said conclusively. At least let me take a look at your shoulder. You're supposed to be eager to leave. I've got bandages and need alcohol, and you've got nothing but your bare ass. Savile went sighed. I wouldn't get high and mighty if I was you, and get a couple of these painkillers down you, past the sell-by date. But the doctors say the important thing is to believe. A goodbye present. The bullet had passed right through. They splashed alcohol on the wound and bandaged it up. That would do it. Lioka let them rinse out his mouth, too. And he put his faith in the painkillers. That's what you get for interfering, the stalker told Art Young. No one's going to let you save everybody. The Lone Ranger. Fuck it. Art Yom didn't want to talk about it. Savaliwa slammed the doors, took hold of the driving wheel, and swung round. When he was already halfway through the gates, he braked for one last time. He stuck his head out of the window. They'll kill you, you cretins. What the fuck can I do about that? Art Yom replied to the clouds of bluish smoke blowing into his face. They closed the gates by hand. How long would they hold out when the assault started? Three minutes? Five? What did you stay for? Oh, sure, said Lioka. Just go driving off somewhere or other. Let's get this fucking shit cleared up quick and then go home. Maybe we can still slip through. I'll go and look for something we can use. Listen, Art Young. I've been beating my brains out. What do they want these jammers for, anyway? Ask the Reds that one. Maybe so they can tell everyone on the outside that they are the Metro. That they're the ones in charge here? Maybe they're preparing to attack Hansa and getting help from someone on the outside. You saw the equipment they have, right? How could there be anything like that left in the Metro? And that 4x4 at Teatralnaya Station, he told himself. They were picking off the fascists in their uniform protective suits. War, wasn't it? Right then. He'd explained it to Lyoka, but not understood it himself. Why would anyone do that? Why would they keep 40,000 people, or however many it was, under the ground? What goal would justify doing that, he wondered. Go up on the roof. The machine gun's still up there. Keep an eye on the road. He hobbled past the radio operator again. Where do you keep your grenades here? The weapons locker was standing there empty. They'd grabbed everything during the alarm. The little rooms. One had bunks in it. The other was the mess. You couldn't hide anything there. Walking back past the control room, he glanced in. All the lights had gone out. Silence and dust hanging in the air. It was a pity about one thing. Sviatoslav Konstantinovich, you legless old fogey. You'll listen to the airwaves when they all thaw out, but there won't be anyone left for you to apologize to. If I could just get back to Moscow alive and sit down to listen to the radio with you. There you go, Dad. In connection with our conversation. I'm totally schizo, of course. And I'm definitely an obsessive psychopath. And no way am I worthy of that little daughter of yours. But here you go, Sviatoslav Konstantinich. Listen to this. Listen, listen, don't frown like that. Yes, that's St. Petersburg. And this here is Paris. Uh-huh, that's English. Right, then that's Vladivostok. Impossible, eh? No, it isn't, because God knows when. But the red line set up jammers. Jammers, Sviatoslav Konstantinich. Oh yes, you probably know all about those, don't you? Unlike me? Eh? Uh, you know, but you missed this. We thought they'd broken all their teeth on the order. We thought they were desperate to get that bunker. We got half our boys killed, just so they wouldn't get their hands on that bunker. But maybe they weren't interested in that old bunker of ours? Maybe they had bigger things in mind? Isn't it just possible, Sviatoslav Konstantinik, that they were simply using it as a cover, distracting us, grinding us down in that siege, so we wouldn't notice what was really important? Eh? 
He took the radio operator's mask, too, to replace his own one-eyed version and went back outside. He walked round the building and came out facing the pylons, firmly planted with their roots in concrete and held down on the ground by steel cables on all sides. No way to cut them down, no way to rock them and push them over. On the closest one, he saw a ladder made of reinforcing bars, and he climbed up to see how much time was left. You miss them, Sviatoslav Konstantinich. You miss the jammers, you miss the big trucks, you botch things with the war. You're getting old, Dad. You might not believe me, of course, because I'm obsessed, but you listen. Listen to the radio. Listen and tell me this. What's our order's mission now? To carry on peddling pig shit? Or to get people out onto the surface? To get our boys killed so the people here can all stay Morlocks? Or to help them get to a place where the radiation will be bearable? Where they can live? What good is all this to me? No good at all. I'm not going to be Moses after all, Sviatoslav Konstantinovich, and I really couldn't give a damn. I was just trying to look good for this little whore. I won't have time to be Moses for a while. I get demobilized in three weeks. Three weeks and I'll be off. Back to May with the little orange ducks to lick my ice cream. But you could have been Moses, and you still can be. It doesn't say anywhere that no one with physical disabilities gets taken on for the Moses job, eh? Right then. Go to hell. His shattered knee wouldn't bend or straighten out. He had to scramble up to the sky the same way he scrambled out of that pitch-black hell, skipping lamely, hauling himself up. He climbed until the grounds inside the concrete wall were the size of a pack of cigarettes. The wind up there was angry. It tried to blow Artyom off and carry him away. The pylons swayed, despite the steel hawsers. He saw a little doll-sized Lyoka. He saw a little toy excavator. Through a bald patch in the woods, he saw the sand pit with the dead men and the little toy windmills. To the west, in the direction of the city, his view of the highway was blocked by blank-eyed high-rise buildings. But to the east, he had a clear view all the way to the horizon. There was no trace of Savalis already. He was in a big hurry to get home. But Art Yom did spot something else. Something like little beetles scrambling feebly along the road in the far distance. A pity the stalker had taken his sniper's rifle with him. Could those be people? As he was climbing down, he thought, But where were you before, people? Why didn't you ever reach us? With the radio, it was probably like this. The Reds set up these pylons, well, so that no one in the metro could contact any other cities. So okay, the radio's dead. But if there were other places that were alive, inhabited, surely someone must have tried to get to Moscow. There weren't any people from those other places in the metro. Artyom hadn't seen them, and neither had anyone else that he knew. So how come? We didn't know anything about you. They stopped our ears and blindfolded us and drove us underground. They told us that the place where you were born is the place where you belong. But didn't you really give a blind damn about us? He jumped down onto the dusty ground, leading with his sound leg and shuffled off rapidly towards the guardhouse by the gates. Maybe he could find some grenades. Well, what? Lyoka shouted to him. There's someone on the road, walking in from out of town. Keep your eyes peeled. People from some other town out there, interesting. Or maybe a reconnaissance party, returning to the outpost. He'd find out soon. Very soon now. He'd almost skipped and hopped all the way to the guardhouse when it suddenly struck him. The excavator. A huge brute like that must be able to topple the pylons, with its bucket, or by towing, if only it was in working order. He turned away from the guardhouse towards the corner. He hopped over to the monster across the wild grass and weeds crushed down by the caterpillar tracks. The orange paint was peeling off. The glass cabin was cracked. The arrowhead of the bucket was resting on the earth wearily and dejectedly, like a drunk lying with his face in the mattress. Was it working? He scrambled up onto a caterpillar track and into the cabin. What did it look like? Not like anything. There wasn't any steering wheel. There were levers instead. One had a fancy knob on it, a fly in glass, and another had a metal skull. Ah, no, there were pedals sticking out of the floor, too, with buttons beside them. The ignition lock was taped over with something, but the wires were sticking out of it. Disconnected ends. Should he give it a try? Red to red, blue to blue? Do you use this heap of junk or don't you? Well, he joined the bare ends together. Something awoke inside the brute. Metal jerked convulsively and started trembling. There was a puff of black, sooty smoke. 
Artyom set his foot on a pedal uncertainly. He tried to move off, but the convulsion that had almost brought the machine to life passed off, and the machine faded out. Went quiet. Died. Had Artyom done something wrong? He felt hot under the gas mask. It wasn't me who broke it. He looked at the cracked and split instrument gauges. The fuel gauge needle was licking at the zero in its thirst. The end. He could hear the wind towers again, hammering at his ears, at his ears and his nerves. The little windows in his gas mask missed it over. Time was running out. He had no solution. He shouldn't have stayed, and he shouldn't have allowed his apostle to stay. He walked round the excavator and found where to pour in the diesel. He shouted into it, Woo, motherfucker. Dragging his leg, he hopped over to the guardhouse. Maybe there was something in there. A grenade launcher? No, of course not. No grenade launchers. There were two dead men. One in the doorway, crawling outside, another in a room, staring up at the ceiling. Neither of them happened to be carrying any explosive. No reason to. Savali was right. There wasn't a thing that Art Yom could do to those pylons. They had stood there before. They were still standing there, and they would carry on standing there. The trucks would come back. Men without any insignia would shoot the two lost idiots and fling them to the dogs, who would blunt their teeth on lead. They'd replace the fuses, splice the torn wires together, and the aerials that could reach right to the other side of the world would start whispering again in chorus, that quiet whisper smothering any screams. And everyone who was already used to life underground, to an empty globe, wouldn't have to change their ways. They wouldn't even have time to hear anything. Before they could even blink, the radio would be transmitting their favorite tuberculosis ward program. The world just flashed once and then went out again. They would be the sane ones again, and Art Yom would be a psycho. Well, what? Leoka shouted from the roof. Nothing, nothing so far, Art Yom answered. So far? It still wasn't too late to leave, was it? Abandon this damned place, hide and let the big trucks go hurtling past? Pretend to be a dried-out passenger in a rusty car, crawl along the long, long shoulder of the road to Moscow, and then somehow, something. Another three weeks, or two. Back into the radio center, past the control room again, through the rooms again, banging the doors, kicking the cupboards and chairs. Where? Where was there anything anywhere in this place? How do I destroy you, you brutes? How do I annihilate you? The mute radio operator got under Artyom's feet. He dragged him aside in a fury, and to spite him, the man left a dirty track. Back outside. Where hadn't he looked? He ran round behind the building, raked through the bushes and combed through the grass. Then back into the blacked-out guardhouse. Hi there, hi there! Since the television had fainted, it was showing a gray mirror world, and everything in the mirror world was the same, only even more crooked and more stupid. If there was any electricity, at least he could have observed the perimeter. If there was any electricity, he could... He hobbled to the transformer building. He swung the door wide open and propped it like that so the creaking wind couldn't slam it. I was in too much of a hurry. Sorry. Maybe I can fix that here, eh? If there was electricity, I could... So clearly, the only thing that can be done... On all wavelengths. You whisper on all wavelengths, right? Is that how you work, you bastards? On all the wavelengths, on short wave and medium wave, and probably even on long wave, instead of music and call signs, you hiss, you blind. But if I can't knock you down, maybe I can teach you to talk. His fingers were clumsy in the thick rubber. The shadow didn't belong to him. It wouldn't let any light through. It stopped him from seeing. His lenses had steamed up, and now they were running with water. What had he broken here? He started tying together broken wires, clicking fuses back into place, trying to persuade them. Nothing. There wasn't any light. The wind towers were groaning, but there wasn't any light. Liok! Lioka! He skipped outside. Do you have any kind of clue about electricity? Why? Come down for a sec and take a look. It was two long minutes before he came in. Did you do that? You vandal, he mumbled through his crushed teeth. Do you have any idea? We you some. I wanted to be an electrician, a we paid job. Only no one will fucking wet you work. They've got their own mafia. Artyom looked out and stuck his face in between the bars of the gates. There wasn't anyone on the road. 
So those beetles hadn't managed to crawl all the way here yet? Had they missed the turning? The first apostle was still fiddling with the distributor board, shifting fuses about, mumbling something to himself under his breath. The little electric bulb under the ceiling dangled there, lifeless, its flask empty. Okay, do you hear? Drop it. Forget it. It's not your thing. Let's go home. And Artyom looked bleakly at the dreary, gray wall assembled out of big concrete squares and realized there was no way home from here, because the wall was so easy to climb over that it was a trap. It was easy to get inside, but you couldn't get back out. He'd just keep on scurrying round the bait spellbound until the spring lashed out and broke his back. And what is my thing? Leoka asked. Trading in shit at ten buets a bucket for the west of my life? Shove over, you're blocking my white. You're a bastard, Artyom told him. I appointed you my apostle, and you abuse me. Well, aren't you funny? Come on, why don't I take you on as my apostle? You know, my mother prophesied a great future for me. Leoka snagged something with his fingernail and clicked it, and there was light. Artyom's heart leapt. He grabbed hold of Leoka and squeezed him as hard as he could. That's it! You're the savior here, not me! Go watch the road! He limped past the creaking into the radio center. A light bulb was working in the buffer zone. He burst into the control room and straddled the chair on wheels. Teach me to understand, gobbledygook. What was this here on the switches? He forced himself to breathe out, blinked his eyes clear, and went through the inscription systematically, from top to bottom and right to left. He found a switch. E dot gen D U S W deciphered it as interference generator and moved it down. The others were S W L W and various different frequencies scattered haphazardly across the makeshift console. He stuck the headphones on and clicked his way through the frequencies. Were they clear of hissing now? He'd driven the snakes out of all the wavelengths, hadn't he? It seemed like he had. Now what? The pylons were a metal forest growing outside the window, every one of them draped in wire lianas and tangling its own frequency up in them, sucking the living juice out of it. That was why there were so many of them here, to silence all the distant voices at once. So can I replace them with my voice? His fingers fumbled across the switches again like fingers. Engage broadcasting on USW study UMW. Artyom touched the microphone on the headphones. He bent it towards his mouth. Listen to me. He traced where the wire dived down to with his fingers and found a switch with a little lamp on the console. He pressed it in and coughed into his own ears. He coughed into the ears of the entire planet. Artyom froze. He pulled off his gas mask. They had to hear him clearly. All of them. Every word he said. He licked his cracked lips. This is Moscow. Do you hear me? St. Petersburg, Vladivostok, Voronezh, Novosibirsk, do you hear me? This is Moscow. We're alive. I don't know if you heard us before. We couldn't hear you. We thought we were the only ones left. We thought <laughs> there wasn't anyone else. Nobody and nothing. Do you understand? How could you understand? You've been chatting to each other all this time. While we... Oh, Lord, thank God that you're alive, that you're there, out there, singing songs... How are you out there? We've been here all these years, underground. We were afraid even to stick our heads out. We thought there was nowhere to go. Can you believe that? We had no radio. There were no signals. Some bastards here set up jammers. In Moscow. In Balashika. And they hid you from us. It was as if we were deaf and blind. We sat here for 20 years. I've been here for 20 years and I'm only 26. Sitting here, down under the ground. My name's Artyom. Down in the basement. In the metro. Did you at least try to find us? I tried to find you. We tried. We thought the whole world had been burnt up. The whole planet. That there was nowhere to go. To crawl out to. But we still searched. We hoped. How are you? You have dances there. I want to come and see you so much. Can you breathe out there without a gas mask? What's your air like? We don't know anything about you. We've spent 20 years here alone. I don't even know why. What for? Why did we sit here in the darkness, surrounded by concrete? We'll find out who did this to us. We'll smash their fucking jammers. We'll be together again. This is Moscow. We'll be with you, with the whole world. We're alive. Do you understand? Everyone's alive, and so are we. 
Maybe you have relatives here. 40,000 people survived here. How many of you are there? We'll be a country. We'll live on the surface like before, like human beings. I... There was so much I wanted to say to you. I rehearsed what I was going to say a hundred times in my mind. And now I've forgotten it all. I hope you can hear me at least. I'll speak here for as long as I can. Then they'll probably switch me off. The people who put up the jammers, who cut us off from you, they'll come back. We'll try to hold out here for a while. But there are only two of us and lots of them, the Reds. Just don't think that you're imagining this or that this is all a joke. I'm real. My name is Artyom. If they kill me, others in Moscow will hear and they'll lead the rest of them out. Are you there, Moscow? Hansa? Polis? Everyone who hasn't forgotten yet? Who else is listening? I'm not the only one. We've been tricked. We've all been tricked. We could have left our shelter a long time ago and gone wherever we wanted, driving or walking, anywhere at all, even as far as Paris or Ekaterinburg. The Reds hid everything from us. What for? So there wouldn't be any hope? I don't know what for. I can't understand it. We can just... We can just live now. All go up on the surface and live, like before. Like human beings, the way people are supposed to live. Live, do you hear me? There, I haven't gone insane. They are there. They exist. All of Russia and Europe and America. They're all real. Listen for yourselves. And now we exist too. He switched off broadcast mode to let the cities babble instead of him and took off the silenced headphones. Had he been broadcasting to no one or whispering at least to someone? He couldn't tell. Enough bleeding. Let them listen to the others for themselves. Let them listen to the earth. Artyom, some people have arrived. Artyom. Artyom grabbed his automatic, pulled on his mask, hobbled out of the buffer zone and jabbed his gun barrel at the dust swirling in the creaking wind. There were three of them standing behind the bars. All three were holding their hands up, showing that they didn't want to fight. Their gas masks, they looked like they were homemade, were lowered onto their chests, hanging on their straps. The protective suits, also homemade looking, didn't hang loose and baggy like the crude standard army ones, but were cut to fit the figure precisely. Two of them were young guys who looked like each other, like brothers. The third was a powerful man with a gray beard and long gray hair gathered into a bun at the back of his head. The young guys exchanged glances and smiled. They are here, after all. They're here, Dad. People. I told you I heard it, one of them said, glancing round proudly at the older man. Hello, the older man said calmly and confidently. Artyom didn't lower his gun. He looked at these men. The young guys were rosy-cheeked and close-cropped. They'd put their homemade sawn-offs down on the asphalt, and their hands were empty. Artyom could have cut them all down with a single burst through the bars of the gates, but the outsiders didn't seem to expect him to do that at all. The young men smiled, at each other, at Artyom, like Cretans, not like people from these parts. Their father looked at Artyom calmly, not afraid of anything. His eyes were blue. They hadn't even faded with age. There was a silver ring dangling from his left ear. Who are you? Artyom droned through his trunk. Is this Moscow already? We're on our way to Moscow. This is Balashika. What do you want from us? Nothing, the man answered staidly. My lads got it into their heads that someone was still alive in Moscow and they were calling for help. So we got out stuff together and came. Where from? Where are you from? From Murom. Murom? It's a town between Vladimir and Nizhny. Nizhny Novgorod. How many kilometers? From here? Three hundred, approximately. You walk three hundred kilometers to get here? On foot? Who are you, anyway? I'm Arseny, the gray-bearded man said. This is Igor, and this is Mikhail, my sons. Igor, this one, tells me that he picked up a radio signal from Moscow. Where we're from, they think Moscow was completely burnt out. He convinced his brother, and then the two of them convinced me. What for? Well, it's like this. As I said on the radio, they were calling for help, trying to find out where people had survived, and abandoning people in trouble. It's not Christian, but I can see you're managing just fine here without us. Maybe we could have some tea? It's been a long journey. Stay where you are! Sorry, Arseny laughed. Is this a high-security facility you have here? What we have here, Artyom looked round at Lyoka. Lyoka raised his hand. Everything's under control. Is a facility. Did you see any cars on the road? 
A pickup drove past, going the other way. We thumbed him, but he shot past like a bat out of hell. Thumbed him? Held our hands out, you know, so he would stop. We wanted to check the way. So he would stop, Artyom snickered. Don't they do that round here, give people lifts? Artyom didn't answer. He listened through the wind towers. Was this an ambush? You walked 300 kilometers to save people you don't know? Do you expect me to believe that? Okay, we can do without the tea. Let's move on, Arsny declared. No, Dad, no. What are you saying? Where to? Igor, Arsny snapped to his son. Don't argue. Well, at least ask what it's like in Moscow. Is there really anyone still alive there? Or, you know, mister, I play around with the radio, and I pick something up a few times. Things like, this is Moscow here. Come in, St. Petersburg, or maybe Rostov. What was that? What was that? Art Yom repeated. He ran his glance over them, over their strange clothing, their raised empty hands, their dangling gas masks, single pieces of glass instead of separate eye lenses. And he saw his own reflection, behind the bars, with a rubber face and round, misted-up eyes. Drunk, wounded, full of painkillers, he gazed into his own suspicious gun barrel. For some reason, he remembered the Dark Ones, that day on the observation platform of the Ostankino Tower. Why did he remember that? Should he believe or not? Wait. He went into the guardhouse and slowly and deliberately pressed the button that opened the gates. He heard a creaking sound outside. There were three of them, still standing in the same place, and they hadn't lowered their hands. Their guns were lying on the ground. Come in. They exchanged glances again. Let's go inside. You can bring your guns. I'll tell you about Moscow. And there are bodies in there. Don't be afraid. I don't expect you to believe me. I wouldn't believe it. I'm speaking out loud right now, and I don't believe it. I can't understand it. I know it with my mind, but I can't understand it. Cool. Igor or Mikhail even clapped his hands. Now this is life. Things are really moving. And will you show us the metro? Murom's such a rotten hole. Nothing ever happens there? Artyom didn't answer. Well then... Arsene tugged on his earring. Are you going to stay here until they kill you? I have to. I'll try to hold out for as long as I possibly can. Basically. That's the story with Moscow. Maybe they didn't have time to send a signal when we stormed them. But they've heard everything now for sure. They'll be here soon. Go home. It's not your concern. Afterward, you can come back sometime. If you want to. When it's all over here, and you'd better not go along the road... Arseny didn't move. Igor and his brother squirmed restlessly on their hard stools. Their father was smoking with Artyom, and the sons looked at him enviously but didn't dare to ask for a cigarette. I don't want to go home, Dad, Mikhail or Igor protested in a light bass voice. Let's stay. I'd like to help. There's no point, said Artyom. How many men do they have? Maybe twenty, maybe more, and they'll be prepared. Even five of us won't be able to hold out, and then... It's the Red Line. Thousands of people live on it. It has an army. A genuine army. Let's stay, Dad. Go. Don't stay. Go and tell the people there, in that Muram of yours. Can you really breathe outside without a filter? Yes. And vegetables. Do they grow? Normally? We cover them to protect them against the rain. The rain's dangerous. We purify our water, but otherwise, yes, tomatoes, cucumbers. Tomatoes, that's fantastic. It's weird to hear about communists and about fascists, like something out of the last century. Artyom shrugged. Now he wondered how he hadn't guessed right from the start that these three men couldn't be scouts from the outpost. They looked nothing like people from the metro. Nothing at all. As if they, they'd just flown in from Mars. Back there, what do you believe in? We live in the monastery there, not in the actual town. We have an old, beautiful monastery on the riverbank, the Holy Trinity Monastery, a genuine fortress. You know, a white fortress with sky-blue domes, an incredible place. It's impossible not to believe in God there. And in yourself, basically, Igor or Mikhail barked fervently. You're lucky, Artyom smiled at them raggedly. We don't have a monastery. We don't even have ourselves. There's fuck all left. Arsene screwed his cigarette butt into a crumpled tin that had contained some kind of prehistoric fish and got up. You have to tell people this. You have to tell them about everything, and you're wasting time on us. Go. I'll see you off. No need. You tell people, and we'll do our best to let you talk for as long as possible. They're coming. 
I can see them from the pylon. They're coming. Is that them? The wind grew tired and the creaking died away. Suddenly it was quiet outside. Cotton wool muffled quiet like on the garden ring road. And the only sound in this silence came from motors that didn't seem menacing, still far away, droning in high voices. How many of them are there? And without waiting for an answer, Artyom set off up into the sky again himself. He glimpsed them in a gap between the high rises. One, two, three, and then they disappeared. Three trucks for certain, maybe more. Yes, there were more. Another two. Five identical trucks coming this way from Moscow. The bedraggled, prefabricated buildings hid them and cut off the sound. They probably had about ten minutes left to travel. How many people were in those trucks? Fifty men could get in. They had machine guns on their roofs. And they were probably snipers, too. They'd fire simultaneously if they stormed the place. None of Artyom's troops would even have time to blink. They'd all be mown down and fed to the dogs. Ten minutes. He had to get down then and start his final broadcast, so he'd have time to say everything. Arsny and his sons and Lyoka would buy him a little bit of time, those good people. And now, no more irrelevant chatter. Could anyone pick him up or not? Moscow hadn't replied even once. But they didn't need a two-way radio to listen, did they? A receiver was enough. Let them say nothing. Just as long as they were listening. Artyom thought he heard another whoosh of sound in the distance. He turned his ear towards it. Screwed up his eyes. From the east, out of nowhere, out of Russia, a little dot was hurtling towards the outpost. A column of dust. It was farther from the turn to the radio center than the trucks, but it was rushing along faster. Who? Never mind crawling down, it was time for him to jump. But Artyom couldn't let the dot go until it grew a little bit. Something gray, silvery. Not a dot, more like an automatic rifle bullet. A long shape, a station wagon. Savelli. In his hurry, his feet slipped on the thin reinforcement bars. The alcohol and painkillers were fizzling out already and it wasn't too easy to move now. He lost a few seconds. He wanted to explain everything to Igor Mikhail, but he realized it would be quicker if he did everything himself. They were both waiting down in the yard, jumpy, frightened, and joyful. Get up to the second floor! You can fire from the windows! He ordered the brothers. Lioka, watch the road! He opened the gates, and instead of making his radio broadcast, ran out onto the highway. Right now, there were only five of them, and Artyom was going to broadcast. But if Savalio got here in time, he would count as two. But was he coming back to them? What had he left behind? There was a ringing sound in both his ears. The trucks folded together into one, like a deck of cards, rushing along with their lights on, not trying to hide. From the opposite direction, the low-slung station wagon was flying straight towards the trucks, as if it was going to shatter itself against them. The meat-grinding blades had halted, waiting for a delivery of men. Artyom waved to Savelli. Come on, we're waiting! And he ran back into cover. The roaring of the large trucks was already quite distinct when Artyom heard a squeal of brakes on the highway. The station wagon bullet got there first, twisted itself into the turn at full speed, and squeezed in through the gates as they were closing. It was Savelli, after all. Savelli! I, er, uh, decided to postpone my vacation, he explained with his head in the car trunk as he pulled out the large bag with the machine gun. We'll finish off this job first, and then I'll go. Artyom wanted to hug Savelli and kiss his wrinkled skin. Lousy damn heroics, he said to him instead. We'll pump the diesel out of their cam-ass trucks, the stalker said with a wink. Diesel, Artyom echoed. Are you driving on diesel? That's right. Give me the canister. Watch a want? Give me the canister. Come on, diesel, give me some diesel. He tore the large plastic flask of murky liquid out of Savali's hands and galloped off with it to the comatose excavator, glancing round all the time at the wall. Where would they come over it? At the same place Art Yom had? Get that down, you! Art Yom poured a gulp of liquid rainbow from the canister into the excavator's dry throat. Gulp it down. You wanted some too, right? Even with the ground teeth and the blood mixed in. Let's all get wasted here before it's all over. The soldiers shot a vodka before the action. He climbed up onto a caterpillar track. What are you doing? Savali was loitering nearby, down below. I'm going to uproot those fucking pylons! Artyom tied the wires together, 
cautiously, soundlessly, and prayerfully, as if he was talking to a mine. The trucks were already roaring right there at the turn. Then they cut out. Were they offloading the assault force? He pressed a pedal. Come on, Coom Oan. The excavator jerked spasmodically. It snorted, roused itself, roared, woke up, came alive. Alive! There were the levers, two in front and two more, one each side of the seat. Artyom touched one and the boom moved upwards. He touched another and it swung round, slamming its teeth into the wall. Smack! Those two levers! Savelli yelled to him. At the front, like in a tank! Get out! Get out, you bonehead! Let me do it! He scrambled up onto a track at the second try and shoved Artyom to make him clear out of the cabin. He grabbed hold of the levers. Move aside or I'll splat you! He moved his hands apart and the excavator, all fifty tons or however many it was, started turning round as if was whirling into a dance and started spinning round on the spot. Bo beautiful, I missed my caterpillars, Savily laughed. Where do we start? From the ones farthest away. Start with the farthest ones. Get it away from here. Outside the concrete wall, the men without any insignia had probably already scattered. Maybe they were already uncoiling grappling hooks, and the snipers were weaving nests in the branches of trees. One second too long now, and he'd be too late forever. He ran to the radio center, forgetting about his knee. That's it! That's it! He thought he glimpsed men's shadows through the trees. Someone darted past the gates. There's a radio in there, and there's a voice. They're trying to call you, Mikhail Igor shouted from upstairs. They're surrounding us, spreading out all around. Shall I fire? Leoka called from the roof. The resurrected excavator crawled slowly past the control room, enveloped in sooty smoke, with its only arm covered in cadaverous spots already raised to strike. Come in, this is urgent, the headphones squealed in a mosquito voice. So who'd got the urge to call right now? Why didn't you say anything sooner instead of keeping mum? Artyom couldn't breathe. He threw his hand out, flung open the window, and started breathing sweet smoke. And then he heard a nasal voice from a megaphone. We order you to leave the building immediately and lay down. Your weapons, we promise, to spare your lives otherwise. That one, the farthest. Artyom gestured through the window. The excavator clattered its rusty bones and trudged off where it had been told to go. Would it be strong enough? Would it have enough rainbow? Artyom! The headphones on the table chirped, gathering all their strength. Can you hear me, Artyom? He picked them up too slowly. He didn't want to put them on his head and block his ears with them. The machine gun on the roof stuttered. To frighten them off, or had they launched the assault? Who is this? Artyom! It's me! It's Let Yaga! Let Yaga Artyom! What? Let Yaga Artyom, it's me! Group A minus! Come on now, it's me! What are you... Did you hear me? You heard me! The Reds were jamming all frequencies. I wasn't out of my mind. The whole world! We're the only idiots under the ground. I'm just going to demolish those fucking jammers right now. Tell Miller, tell him, that I... Wait! Do you hear me? Stop, Artyom, don't... Wait! I can't! I can't wait! The Reds are here! Reds all around us! They'll storm us in a moment! They'll grind us to pulp! But we'll have time to smash those fucking... No, they won't grind you to pulp! We can... We'll make a deal with them! Don't touch anything! The machine gun exploded in another paroxysm, and thunder peeled inside the building. They were blazing away from the upper floor, too. Who with? The Reds? Make a deal? It's not the Reds! Not the Reds, Artyom! There was an abrupt, mighty crash outside the window, and another. Artyom heard a long, infernal grating sound, like an iron curtain being raised from horizon to horizon. Weary steel groaned like an immense horn, and a toppled pylon tumbled over unhurriedly and majestically to lie alongside the building, almost right across the enclosed grounds. The earth shook. Too late! It's all over here! We're smashing the fucking lot! No, you mustn't smash them. I know. We know about the jammers. It's not... It's not what you think. I can stop those men. I will stop them. There won't be any assault. Just wait for me, Artyom. Wait. I'll explain everything. There was another clang and another groan. Who is it? Tell me. What's it all for? Artyom tore off the headphones and stuck his head out of the window. A gray man was dangling on the wall, crucified on the barbed wire. He tried to free himself, but the strength had deserted his arms. 
The excavator screeched and raised its arm again. Cease fire! Stop the assault! The order! Miller! Let Yaga the Mosquito squeaked somewhere off to one side. Artyom! Artyom! They'll wait! You wait too! I'm already on my way! Do you hear me, Artyom? The machine gun quieted down. Had the gray men pulled back or had a sniper found Leoka? Boom! And another baobab tree released the grip of its cement roots on the dry earth and its crown's grip on the clouds and started healing over painfully and reluctantly. We are one blood, thou and I, right, Letyaga? One blood. If I'm not with you, who am I with? Stop. sto o o op Artyom leaned out as far as his waist so that Savelia could spot him. The excavator started pondering. But the pylon was already felled anyway, and it started sinking down heavily past the window onto the ground. Artyom breathed out black smoke and believed what the headphones said. He couldn't have done anything else. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, Letyaga. How old are you? Mikhail asked Artyom. Igor was the one who was slightly shorter and a bit more delicate. Mikhail was more coarsely molded with less care. And he was a bit slower because of his extra body weight. Artyom had finally begun to tell them apart. Twenty-six, said Artyom. In March, that was. Your sign's Aries, then? Igor inquired. I wouldn't have a clue. The thirty-first. One more day and I'd have been born on the first of April. April Fool's Day. I should have hung on for a bit, probably. Aries, a ram, stubborn. twenty si i ek Mikhail raised his black eyebrows. Oh, man, I'd never have said that. How old would you have said? I don't know, forty? Thanks a fucking bunch. Don't listen to the little fools. Arsene pulled a hair out of his beard. For them, anything over twenty is forty already. And how old are you two? I'm seventeen. I'm nineteen. Strange, Art Yom remarked after thinking for a moment. Neither of you is twenty yet, but you were both born on the surface. Asterisk was Art Yom surprised when he stopped at the gates? He certainly was. The same armored off-roader that had blasted lead at him and chased him along Tverskaya Street. The very same one. The heavy door was moved aside and let Yaga jumped down into the dust without a mask. I'm alone! Let me in! The off-roader slammed itself shut, reversed, and set off back to where it had come from, towards Enthusiast's Highway. Artyom took a look at the cameras and only then opened up for Let Yaga. Let Yaga shook his head, puffed out his cheeks, and squinted at Artyom. Then he hugged him. You look lousy, brother. That's working in the open air. Right, fine work. You've stirred up trouble big time. Me? The old man will give you a roasting. Let's go to the radio. Artyom led his visitor inside. They were waiting there, Arseni and his sons. Lyoka was looking into the trees from the roof. Savelli had curled into a tight ball in the excavator so that the snipers couldn't get a bead on him. The gray men had promised a truce, but they hadn't named the terms. He felt uneasy. Who's this? Letyaga nodded suspiciously at the outsiders. People. They're people, brother. Live people from another town. From Murom. They came to save you and me. From Murom? Letyaga asked Arseny. Is that somewhere north of here? It's to the east of Moscow, Arseny replied. And who are you going to save us from, Grandad? Let Yaga asked. From the Horned Devil? Someone like you, maybe only from himself. Arsene smiled at him. And where's your Miller? Artyom walked past the radio operator into the control room. I'm itching to talk to him myself. He only turned his back on Let Yaga for a second. A flurry of hasty popping sounds. Artyom swung round at the popping, at the sudden hoarfrost along his spine, at the gurgling, and there were the travelers stretched out across the floor, all three of them. And Letyaga was strutting between them like a stork, finishing each one off with a shot in the head from above. When he saw Artyom, he dropped his Stetchkin pistol on the floor. Then he raised his hands. Only half a minute, and he had killed three people forever. You... what have you... what for? The sight of Artyom's automatic snagged on his protective suit. His hands were shaking, but Let Yaga was a patient man. He waited for Artyom to take proper aim at him. People from Murom, they came to us, you bastard. Easy, easy, Artyom, don't. You scum, you traitor, you've turned traitor. Listen, calm down, it's over. It's over. What's over? What? What did you kill them for? The smiles were still on Arsene's and Igor's faces. Holes in their foreheads and smiles on their lips. 
Mikhail looked serious. The floor was completely flooded with sticky gunk now, impossible not to step in it. They're spies. We have orders, Artyom. What orders? Who has? Who from? Concerning exposure, countermeasures to exposure, that is. Miller, let him explain it. Down on your knees, hands behind your head. Let me see them. Walk on your knees, into the control room, this way. Come on, where's your Miller? Where is he? Let me... There, see, I'm not doing anything, nothing, just a moment. I'll tune in, it's all over, don't get upset, I understand you, comrade colonel. Put the headphones on the desk and move away, away into the corner. Artyom! A voice hissed in the speaker. Artyom, are you there? What is this, all of this, what is it, tell me what it is, I'll count to three, have you got that? You old... What's going on here? Why is there this lid on Moscow? Why hide the world from us? Why did you lie to me? What for, you lousy rat, you old legless? Why did you lie to me all this time? It's not a lid, Artyom. Miller had swallowed everything without choking. It's not a lid, it's a shield. A shield? It's a shield, Artyom. Those jammers don't hide the world from Moscow. They hide Moscow from the world. What for? What the hell is... The war isn't over, Artyom. We're not the only ones who survived. Our enemies did too. America, Europe... The West, they still have their weapons. And the only reason they don't finish us off, the only reason, is because they're sure that we all croaked and there's nothing left here. That everything was destroyed. If we allow ourselves to be exposed, no matter how it happens, radio or infiltration, if they just find out some way, and they're trying to, then they'll pulverize us immediately, all of us. Do you hear? The jammers mustn't be damaged. Don't you dare touch them. The war was over ages ago. It was never over, Artyom. Never. 